Hey folks, today we're going to be looking at a piece of software called Leapwork, and it is a test automation tool. Um, this is not a solicited review. This is also not a paid review. Uh, it's just a piece of software that actually we found out that one of our customers was using to do test automation. And, you know, um, we've tried various ways of doing test automation in the past, um, including using Selenium, using recording tools. We've written our own custom tool before, which basically takes Selenium recordings and then runs it through as an interpreter um, and performs certain actions so you can build very complex flows. But the challenge with all those tools is ultimately it's too complicated for uh, most users who are not um, programmers or development savvy. So the challenge is, you know, how do you find a tool that your testers can use um, and won't complain about? Right, um, and you know I'm I'm very much impressed by this tool, Leapwork. Uh, this tool, you know, if if we had to classify, if we had to, you know, describe software as powerful, right? I think this is a term that's often overused, but if we think about what that term really means, you know, from a software perspective, what that means for me is that for a very small input we can get a very large output, right? And I think that's the perfect description for leap work. Um, in two days' time, I was able to feel fairly proficient with the tool and build some really complex scenarios and automate those scenarios that if we were doing a Selenium, you know, raw Selenium or even recorded Selenium um, would be quite complex. So today I want to take you through that scenario show you how the tool works. You can make a decision whether this is the right tool for you. Um, it comes with a 14-day free trial that you can download, um, no strings attached. And uh, we'll go through some of the, you know, what I really like about this tool and why I'm here making this video, uh, because I think it's uh, more people need to know about this tool, okay? So let's talk a little bit, you know, before we get started. Um, So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, about the setup of the tool. So when you're doing the trial, you can just install everything, all the components of the tool, on your local machine. Uh, the tool really has three parts. The studio, which is this desktop client. It has the controller, which is basically the, the server, if you want to think about it that way, uh, where you know, when you save the file, it's actually sending all this information to the controller which stores everything as a bunch of SQLite files. Um, and there's a third piece, which is the agent, which is what's used to run the test cases uh, autonomously on a given schedule. Um, so for demo, you don't need to install the agent. You really just need to install the studio and the controller. Um, in a production environment, you install at least one of each. You can install them all on the same server. You can install them on different servers. The documentation is really good. And if you give LeapWork a call, they'll walk you through all that, all that stuff. Um, again, for the demo, you just download it, and you just install everything on your local machine. Setup is really easy. You can finish in five minutes. Um, not a whole lot to read, OK? Now, what I really like about this tool, let's get into it, is how flexible it is in terms of how you can interact with it um, to build really complicated uh, user interactions, OK? So the scenario that we're going to run through today uh, has two users involved um, and two different applications involved. So the scenario is that the first user is going to initiate a document distribution through our portal software, which is going to generate tasks for uh, the second user. The second user is going to log in, upload some documents against those tasks, and that's going to send the task back to the first user to perform the review. Okay. Then what we want to do is we want to go through and launch Outlook and check the emails that get generated as part of the notification. Okay, and we're going to use Outlook Online, but if you when you see this tool, you'll see it. you can also use Desktop Outlook if you want. Um, it has the ability to automate anything, right? Um, so let's get started right now. We're going to create this uh, test case. You can see I already have three here. Um, you create these things called flows. So we'll create a new flow, and we'll just call it. Um, Test 
execution and task completion. Okay, so when you create the flow, um, you get the starting block, and you have many different ways of starting to build your flow. So if you right click, you can add a new building block, or you can see here you have this uh, connector up here. When you hover over here, and you just drag this over and start typing. Okay, so I start typing. I'm going to start a web browser, and you can choose the type of browser you want to launch. Um, you have a lot of other options when you expand this block. We're just going to leave it as is. I'm just going to uncheck this default timeout. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to give it a little bit more time to start up. And we're going to type in an address here. Okay. All right. So now what's interesting is if you look here, we have these two types of connectors when we hover over this, right? We have these green connectors and these blue connectors, okay? And this is, you know, I believe one of the parts where this tool is really, really powerful compared to a lot of the other tools I've used previously. Um, the green connectors here basically allow you to define the flow through your process, whereas these blue connectors allow you to connect um, data into this flow, okay? Um, so I'll give you a very simple example here. Um, let's, let's launch this first, and we'll see how we can use these blue connectors, okay? So we're going to run this on display three here, um, and we just launch this guy, okay? So when you launch it, it's going to close down the instances that it was running previously, um, and then I have this on the other window. It'll bring it over to this window, um, and then it will launch our application, right? So you can see down here, what's really cool about this tool is it actually creates a recording of the entire run, OK? Um, you can see our test failed because by default, all the tests fail unless you have an explicit success condition. But I can step through each step here, right, of the execution. Now, if I click at it, I come back in here. You can see I have the option, uh, the settings for this flow, you know, I have a max runtime, the default end state. So basically, if I don't explicitly specify success, it's going to always fail once it reaches the end. Um, and then I can choose, do I want the, vi the log to be a high quality video? I want no log or I want screenshots, right? So this is really flexible uh, depending on the needs for your compliance or quality. Uh, you know, you can choose different ways of, of recording your flow, okay? Now, this is where you know, I, I really want to start showing you some of the cool stuff you can do with this. So one of the very powerful pieces of this software is this blue connector. Okay? So we have this text here. And I'm going to show you a very you know, basic case here, um, set text. Right? So you have all these different blocks. We're going to have one here that's just going to set text. Okay? Now, what's really cool is I'm going to type my URL here. Okay, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect. You can see this is a blue connector, and this is a blue connector. I can connect these two and set it here. Now what's happening, what will happen is uh, my text field here is actually being passed into uh, this block here. Okay. Now this seems really trivial, but we'll see how this works uh, with some more complicated, more complex um, use cases. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Now that we have this, um, the question is, you know, what's the next step? And like I said before, there's a lot of different ways that you can interact with the software. So I'm going to show you a very basic way. The way I like to use it is, you know, you can start this recorder, but really you can just go step by step. Um, so type web text. This is a very common one. What we're going to do is we're going to type the text into the username block. Okay. So when you when you create this here. Um, it's going to give you this select web element to find, right? If you start the recorder, you're going to go through this automatically. Uh, but here we have this select web element to find, and we're going to click this, and it just brings our tool back up. You can see we're in capture mode here, and it allows us to select the element that we want to type the text into. So we're going to type it here, right? And immediately we've captured the element, and we can type in the text value. I already have it, so I'm going to copy this over and paste it in, okay? Now, remember, this is a blue connector here. So if you had a, you know, let's say you had this information in an Excel spreadsheet, right? You can add a building block here. And you can actually read this from Excel, right? In this case, I'm just going to type it in here. 
because um, it's uh, you know just easier for the, for this demo. Uh, and then we also have to type in the password, right? So we're going to connect this again, and we're going to type text. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing. Is we're going to select the web element. We're going to click here, right? And we're going to type in the password, OK? Now, if I put the password here, it's going to be in clear text. So I don't want to do that on this video. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a building block, set text, right? And in this set text, um, I can actually change this to say that this is a password, OK? Now, I can put my password in here securely, OK? And I, again, just connect this here. So now it is going to pull my uh, password from here. And then what I'm going to do is I want to click, uh, click a web element, OK? So I'm going to click this button here, OK? All right, and that's the beginning of our flow, all right? So this is going to time out and fail, but that's OK. Now what I can do is I can just put my, uh, I can, you know, select this one, and I can run this from anywhere. But I'm going to run it from this block here and hit Control R, and that's going to start the run. Okay. So it's actually started the run on the other window, and it's going to bring it over to this window again. Excellent. Okay. So that's the end of our flow. Again, you can see it failed. Uh, but that's because we didn't define you know, that completing this flow would be a success, right? OK. So that's OK. Um, so it completed our login. And we're just going to leave this here for now, right? Now, what's really interesting, you know, I think one of the most powerful aspects of this, you know, again, we have this blue connector, really powerful, right? But what if we wanted to? Uh, what if we wanted to reuse this? Because we're going to, the login's the same every single time, right? So if we want to reuse this block, what we want to do in leap work is we want to do is create a subflow, okay? And when we create a subflow, it's as simple as selecting the blocks that you want to group together. And, <coughs> excuse me, you create a subflow out of it, all right? So we click this create subflow. And we call it login, right? And that's it. We have a subflow, right? Now, if we look at this subflow right now, if I click into it, um, every time I use this subflow, right, it's going to log in as the same user. Um, and then it's going to use the same password every time, right? But in fact, that's not what I want, right? I want to reuse this login block. But every single time, I'm going to want to use a different user and potentially a different password, right? So that's really easy to do in leap work. What you do is you add a building block, and this is an input, OK? So this is a execution input. Uh, so you put this here. Oh, sorry. So what we want is uh, input. We want a value input, OK? So we give this value input a name. Uh, let's call this one username, right? And we simply connect it here to the username. So now when we type the username, it's going to grab it from this value input, OK? Uh, we want to do the same thing for this as well. We don't want to use this password, fixed password. Um, what we want to do is we're going to add a building block here and just another value input. And we call this one password, OK? And we connect it here. OK, there we go. So now what we want to also do here is we want to get a output for this subflow. So if you don't do the output, you won't have a green connector on the other side. Um, so we, we're going to save that. Now when we come back to our test distribution here, right? you can see our subflow now has two inputs, a username and a password. OK, so we're going to put our username back in here. And we will add our password, um, set text. We're going to add a building block, set text, right? And now what we can do is we can, again, change this to password. 
and put in our actual password here. And look at this. This is the real beauty of this tool is you can just connect all your data together, okay? So it's super easy to use. You know, you can really easily parameterize everything in here. Uh, now we have this fully automated login block, right? So let's see what happens here when we run this, right? We're going to run this. We close the browser. It starts in the other window. It's going to bring it over. And perfect, it completed our login, right? Um, okay. So you can see it's really easy to get started with this tool. Um, and you can see some of the elements of it that make it powerful. But what we really want to do is we want to take this to the next level um, and try to do something complicated, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start a distribution of a document. And there's quite a lot of uh, parameterization and selection that occurs when we do the distribution. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly and you know, I'll give commentary along the way. But I'm not going to go through every detail here. All right, so now we have our basic flow. Uh, we want to do something more complicated. Obviously, that's why you click on this video. You want to see this tool really push its limits, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start the distribution as a uh, as the first user, and part of this distribution, the user has to select multiple criteria. The controls are very dynamic. Um, we're going to see how this tool handles that, okay? And to initiate this, because we have multiple steps we're going through, we're just going to start the recorder, okay? And the recorder is going to start on the other screen but it's going to load here. You can't see the recorder. Um, but it, once it initiates, you get this, uh, you know, uh, you get this cursor here where it's going to start highlighting the things that you mouse over. So we're going to click on the span, okay? And we're going to click web element, right? And you can see we can apply uh, left button click, right click, double click, and so on. It's extremely powerful. It intercepted that click, right? So now I'm going to click apply. And when I click Apply, it records it and actually executes the action. OK, now we're going to click this Upload Site Documents. And this is going to, again, click Web Element, Apply, right? We're just going to go through it really quickly here. We're going to click this guy, uh, click Web Element, Apply. And then we're going to, you can see here, this is a complex front end control that has all sorts of different uh, elements nested and everything. But it doesn't matter. We just click it. And click Web Element. And what we're going to do a little bit differently is that instead of selecting the value, which is the easy thing to do, we actually want to enter the text because this, in case there are multiple values, this gives us the exact value that we want, right? So we're going to type Web Text. In this case, we're going to put in the value directly. Okay. And really powerful, we're going to hit the Enter key to trigger the next part of the flow. Okay, so we click this Capture. And that lets us type in an enter key. And you can see here, uh, it's going to type this and hit enter. We click apply. Then we're going to select a trial. Same thing. We're going to click on this. Left click. And then we're going to type the text in here. Okay. Okay. Oh, we also want an enter. Okay. So let's see how we fix that, all right? So we're satisfied with our recording. You can't see on the other screen, uh, but I'm going to mouse over. I'm going to click OK to save and close the recorder, and it generates all of our steps here, OK? So here are our steps. I'm just going to bring this. I'm going to fold this over here so it's easier to see uh, each of the sub-elements sub of this flow here. All right? And you can see here, the uh, one thing we missed here is we forgot to hit the Enter key, right? So we just capture and hit Enter here, OK? Now, what we can do is let's do this. Let's refresh this page, all right, to test if our flow works. We just start from where we left off. So this is where we would start uh, and Control-R to run our flow, OK? Okay, perfect, right? That's exactly what we wanted. Uh, we didn't even need to, uh, need to wait. 
Now, in some cases, you may actually need for your action uh, to wait a bit. Um, so once you hit enter here, there's actually a service call that occurs. And let's say that service call takes longer than a couple of milliseconds. Um, what we would do here in this case is we would set this await DOM changes. And this is really powerful because you can basically wait for the DOM to settle and have no changes, right? So we're going to wait one second. We're going to, let's make it two seconds. Um, so this way it'll await the DOM change. And once the DOM is fully settled, then we'll uh, continue on to the next step, okay? So now we're here. Let's restart our recorder, okay? And what we're going to do is you can see this is another complex control here. And we're going to go into this input, okay? And what we want to do is we want to click this web element first, right? Then we want to... Uh, again, type web text so we get the exact value. We want Belize and hit enter. Okay. All right. So let's see. It didn't. It didn't quite like that. Let's see if we can see what happened there. Okay. So we click web element, and then we type web text, but it didn't seem to like that. Let's see what happened. We're just going to, uh, let's see what we have here. We're going to close that up, and what we're going to do is we're just going to run it from here and see what happens, OK? OK, so it didn't like the element, right? It didn't like the element. Um, we clicked on it, but when we started typing the web text, uh, it didn't really find, you know, the right place, right? So what we can do is, in this case, we click this, and we can capture a new web element, or we can edit the web element, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to capture the web element again. Um, let's see if we can... Uh, let's bring this out of here. Turn the capture mode off real quick here. And what we want is that's what we want. That guy is what we want, right? So now, let's turn capture mode back on. And that's what we want right there, this input. Okay. So now we change this to a new web element. Uh, maybe we don't even need this step here. We can just delete that. And let's connect these two together. And let's see if this worked. Okay. So we're going to run it from here. So to do that, we just refresh this page. And let's run it from here. OK, let's see what happened. Uh, element was found, but not clickable, right? So I don't know why that happened. But let's try it again. We just refresh. All right, we want to, oh, sorry, we want to run it from here. We have to click this first, right? So you can see if we started here, it found the element in the DOM, but it can't click it, right? So we actually want to start from here. So it clicks, waits now for the DOM to settle. Remember, we put the two-second timeout. OK, Belize. And perfect. Now we got exactly what we want, right? And one of my strategies you know, with this is we're actually going to use this 117 uh, underscore TS. Um, again, we're going to use what we can to always filter our data first, OK? So we're just going to keep going. Right, we're going to keep going. Uh, we're going to start the recorder up again. And now that we typed in Belize, uh, we do have to wait for the DOM to settle because remember, there was an animation screen there. So what we're going to do here is we're going to type the web text here. And we're going to type the exact value again just so that we are sure. SD117 underscore TS UA NVE uh, QC. Okay. So, and then we want to hit enter and apply. All right, so now we have our element here. And we're just going to click on this A. OK, we're going to click this web element, left button. Um, and then we're going to click this distribute. Click the web element. OK, and that's going to bring this up. Again, we're going to type web text here. We're gonna type all.
and hit enter. And we're going to upload a file. And here you have this web file upload. All right. And we're going to uh, try to find this file here. So grab from here. Commerce, our test documents. So we have a 10 kilobyte test document. Um, that's perfect. And now here we want to replace this name. So you can see it automatically populated the name of the file. Uh, but we want to replace this with a specific name for this test case, okay? So this is a challenge because the text is already there, but what we can do is we can send a control A to select all of the text first, right? Then we want to type in the name of our distribution. Whoops. Let's start this over again here. We're going to click this guy. We're going to type web text, and we're going to control, we're going to capture... Control A, and I'm going to type it in here because I'm still in capture mode. Uh, the distribution name is going to be Z. Whoops, turn off the capture mode. The distribution name is going to be ZZ01SD117TSUNA. All right, um, and I'm going to add an extra space. We're going to see why we need this in the end, um, and then we click apply. Okay, and then we're going to click the upload button. Okay. All right, then we want to click the OK button. And then finally, we're going to log out of this user, and we're going to log in as the other user. So before we do that, though, uh, we're just going to finish this recording, but we want to do this log out. We're going to click here. So click this web element, apply, and then we're going to click this web element and apply. Okay. All right. So you can see it's spinning up here. It's doing the logout. And that's going to be really the end of our flow. So we just click OK. All right. So we've just got a whole whole bunch of uh, elements here, right? So here, um, I'm going to name this just so I know what I'm doing here. Um, here, I'm search, searching document type. Okay. And here, I'm clicking document type. And then... We are clicking distribute. That's, that one's easy, so we're not going to mess with that. Then we are um, typing web text here. We're selecting all sites. Okay, that's okay. We leave that. We're going to do our file upload. We're going to type in our document name. We're going to click the upload button. And then we are going to uh, hit the OK to close the dialog, the second dialog. Then we're going to click on the user's login name at the top. And then we're going to sign out, OK? So I can already tell you this, is that there are some of these actions that if we don't await the DOM change, they're going to fail, OK? Um, the reason is because, again, like the message we saw earlier, the elements are going to be on the screen, but you won't be able to click on them, right? Because they're not visible uh, or they're still being rendered, OK? So there are a couple things that I know for sure are going to do this. Uh, one of these is here, after I click Distribute, before I type this text, I actually uh, want to await the DOM change because I know that there's going to be a DOM change involved here. Um, so I'm just going to set this to one second. I think that should be plenty. Um, web file upload, we're not going to need a DOM change there. Um, this, we're not going to need a DOM change. Uh, click Upload, not going to need a DOM change. But remember, there's an animation between these two, right? So here, we do want to await the DOM change. We're going to give it the full three seconds, OK? And then once we finish this, there's an animation here before we get to here. So we're going to await DOM change again in one second. And this one as well, there's a small animation. So I know for certain there's going to be a DOM change. So we give it a, a little wait there, OK? So now what we can do is we can test this again. 
right? So what we want to do is we just come. Um, actually, now we want to test the whole thing because we're not logged in, right? So we want to start from login and run through this full thing once, OK? Let's do that. So we're in login. We're going to control R, OK? Okay, so you can see this is actually going to time out and fail here. Uh, you know, even despite our best efforts, um, it could not find the logout, right? But you can see we actually have the video here. It's really cool, right? You can fully step through um, this video, and it's all time marked. So what we need to do is we need to fix this because we couldn't get the logout for some reason, and that's okay. You know, we just click on this guy here, and we can edit the web element, right? So. If we edit the web element, it's going to show us um, you know, what the selector is right now. And there's different strategies that we can use. We're going to look at the screen in more detail in a little bit. This is extremely powerful. Uh, but look at this strategy here. Maybe this is too complex, right? Maybe the order is not quite right. Uh, there's this other strategy here with the href. This might work, right? So all we have to do is we select the strategy we want, and we click Validate. And there it is. It highlighted it correctly. Okay, um, so that's actually perfect. Is uh, that's that's kind of what we want. Um, so we say, okay, we are going to use this new strategy. We found one element, so let's use that strategy, right? And now what we want to do is let's see if this fixed it. All right, so we're going to start from here. Okay, click. Let's see. Signed out. Perfect. All right. That's exactly what we want. All right. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to notice, though, is that if we look at this whole flow, right, basically any time we want to do this type of document distribution, all we're really going to do is we're going to change the, you know, the values of what we're entering for each of these, you know, for example, the countries or um, the trial or so on, right? So, what if we make this whole giant thing a subflow, right? Uh, that's, that's the true beauty of this tool is, you know, what we can do is we just take everything that we have here, okay? We're going to take everything from here down to here, okay? And we want to include this and this, right? Uh, because this is part of our distribution. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new subflow. Hold on. See here, we want to uh, create a subflow using these pieces, and we're going to say distribute, uh, distribute, uh, distribute trial level all sites. Okay, <coughs> and we click save, and there we go. We have our subflow. Um, you know, we're going to, while we're doing that, we're going to change this into a subflow um, and call this logout. Okay. And save that. So now every time we want to log out, every time we want to do a distribution, uh, we have really well defined subflows. And you can see, like, at a high level now, we can really easily understand what this thing is doing despite all the complexity that's in here. Okay. And that's really one of the beauties of this tool. Is it's so easy to refactor um, what you're doing just by basically creating these reusable blocks. And I can reuse these blocks everywhere now. Okay? Um, I'm going to take this time to just save real quick. And what we're going to do is we're going to come in here, and we're going to parameterize this, because we want to use this generically to distribute all the time. right? And what we can do is we can come in here, we can find, hey, look, here. Here is our, um, you know, our values here, 
what if we just parameterize this? Again, we're going to add a, add a building block here. And we're going to do the input. And it's a value input. And this is, in fact, the, um, this is, in fact, what is this, SCDF? This is the program, right? So we're going to do the program name. Okay, and we will connect this to here. And you can see there's a text field here. That's what we're actually connecting it to, right? Uh, we're going to connect that to, hold on, let's bring it over here, text field. Come on, buddy. So that's not what we want, right? We actually we want to connect it down to uh, this text field. So we, let's try this again. OK, there we go. So we have this field here. We want this to be a uh, program, right? So now, once we've added this field here and renamed it to program, right, uh, we can use it up here, insert the token program, and we still want the enter, so we just put that back in there, and then we're done, all right? So we're going to do this again down here for the trial name. Uh, so what we want is value input. OK, so we have trial name here. Um, this time, I'm just going to add the text field first. We'll just call it trial. And then we connect this to here. All right. And instead of this, now we can insert our token uh, trial. All right. And let's shrink this down. And we need another parameter. for the country. And again, we can we don't have to type it in first. We just connect it first and give it a value here. Replace this. OK. And we're going to add our document type here. Value input. Type, connect it to here. We'll just call it DT for short. OK. Now, here's where you know, I want to show you another piece of this parameterization. OK. So when we are clicking on this, right? Uh, we are actually using a strategy here. You can see it's using this strategy where it's trying to find the href equals this thing, right? Now, this is going to be very limiting because we can't parameterize this. And this is not quite the actual value that we're looking for. It has these additional underscores in here, right? So rather than doing it this way, what we really want is a different type of strategy um, where not the href, we're going to not use this attribute, right? We actually want the text equals to our value that we want to click on, right? But the challenge is we want this to be fully parameterized. And how do we do that? Really easily, right? Anywhere we can insert a token and add a new field. Uh, we have this field one. And we want to rename this, right? Because this is actually our document type name. So we just rename it to, oh, here we go. We want this to be dt. And we're going to delete that, OK? And now we have this uh, token here. So we're going to say self a text equals dt, OK? So it's going to find the a with the uh, document type name in the uh, text, OK? And we click Save. But now we have this empty value here. If we type it in, you know, it's going to be a static value. What we actually want is this parameter here to connect to this field, OK? So you can really start to see you know, the power of the, uh, these data input connectors because you can very easily um, connect all these pieces together, OK? Now, the next part we want to have is the distribution name. We want to uh, value input. Call this distribution name. And we're going to add it here. Field one. We rename this uh, dist name. 
And we're going to replace this value here. Okay, <clears throat> now one of the things we talked about earlier is why I want, wanted this space here, okay? The reason I want this space here is that actually every time we do this distribution, remember, we have to go find it later, right? So the question is, how do we find this um, afterwards if we're going to be searching for it, right? Now, if I run this test multiple times, obviously one thing I can do is change the distribution name every time, but that's a bit of a pain in the butt, right? What I actually want is every time I run it, I want a unique run identifier, all right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to add a field first called uh, session ID. And we're going to put the value in here, OK, session ID. Now what we want to do is we want to have a value input here, OK? And we're going to call this one session ID, right? And we're going to link this to here. Right? And we're going to see how we get this value, all right? because we really want this value to be dynamic. We don't want this to be a fixed value, right? so that every time we run this, we're going to have a different session ID. Okay? So let's take a look at what we have here. Um, we have our program, trial, country, document type, distribution name, session ID, and we're going to save this. Now in our main flow, you can see it's fully parameterized, and now all I have to do is paste my values back in here uh, that I want. OK? And the session ID is where it's going to get interesting, because we want something dynamic every time we run this, right? So there's a building block built into this. You can use, of course, uh, you can use a custom command and generate some GUID or something like that. Uh, but in fact, there's something else you can use in here. And that's generate password. So the generate password, you can specify include uppercase, numbers, symbols. Um, in this case, we don't want symbols. We just want uppercase and numbers. And what we're going to do is once we generate this password, we're going to use that as our session ID. OK? Uh, result value here, right? <coughs> Now, to get this to work, we actually have to connect this up to here like this. And we generate our session ID. I'm going to leave this block down here. We're going to see why in a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to leave this block here, move this here, and move this here. Okay. So this is our, this is our first main flow, um, is that we're going to have this document type. We're going to have this distribution name. Uh, we're going to have the program name and so on. And now we've fully automate, we fully encapsulated this into a uh, predefined uh, subflow. And now if we want to distribute again, we just create a copy. We just add, add the subflow, uh, subflow here. Let's see how we, how we get this guy here. Uh, subflows here. Uh, and then we can select the subflow that we want to use, and we just parameterize it, right? So let's test this all out from here, right? Because we have the, uh, you know, we have this open already. We logged out. Let's run in and initiate a distribution with our generated. Um, let's call this generate session ID, okay? With our generated session ID, okay? So we want to run from here. Control R. Now pay attention to this document name when it types it in. All right, so look at that. We have our identifier connected to it now, right? Perfect. OK. So we have a fully reusable flow. You can see this video recorded everything here. We can, you know, if we play this video, you can see in real time what's happening. You can always come back and, and watch what actually happened, right? And what's really, really beautiful about this, again, is that now this thing is uh, fully reusable, okay? Extremely powerful, right? 
Now what we're going to go in and do is we're going to go in as a user, as the user that's receiving this uh, task now and complete that task, okay? Now this is where the session ID is going to come into play because we need to uh, use the session ID to find the task to complete, all right? So let's add our subflow. Again, since we already have um, this login one, we just put this here. And we're going to put this uh, uh, second user here. And we're just going to reuse this password because the users have the same password in our test cases. And we log in as this user. Um, in fact, we can start our flow directly from here and record the next step, right? So what we actually have to do is we need to wait. Uh, we need to wait five seconds in the real scenario uh, before we log in. The reason for that is because the we're going to connect this guy here. So this guy, you can see here, we don't have the green connector. That's because we need a output block, head block. Okay, execution output. We connect this to here. Save that. And now we have our connector, green connector here for our flow. We actually want that to come to here, and we're gonna get rid of get rid of that. We actually want this to go here. We want to delete this flow. Okay, so that's okay. We'll when we have our next step, we'll we'll figure this out. Um, click web element here. That's okay. We can we can remove this. Uh, perfect. All right. So we're gonna in the real flow, we're gonna wait three seconds for the distribution to complete. Um, we'll make it five. Once we log out, we wait five seconds. Then we log in as the second user. Second user has the same password as the first user for our testing purposes. And now we want to find that task. Okay, so let's run it from right here. So it's going to put in our second user. And you can see here, um, we have the task here, right? The naive solution is to click this, right? Because that's not actually what we want. Um, what we actually want is we want to find the one that's specific to this. Uh, this is a site here. We want to find this specific one and click on this one, OK? So this is our next tricky part is how do we click on this specific one? Number one is we have this hint here, right? But there's three rows with this ID in it. And we actually only want this one with the 331, OK? So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start it with the recording, all right? And then we're going to see how we actually do this, all right? So we're going to start this. Uh, we're going to uh, click web element, OK? Click web element. And the one we want to click, this is obviously what we want to click, right? OK? But the question is, how do we select this um, dynamically? Because our session ID is going to change every time, right? So what we're going to do here is we know, we know that we are going to have to uh, pass in this session ID, right? Whoops. So first thing is we know we're going to need this value, right? Uh, so what we're going to do, let's, let's leave that there for now. And we, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to edit this web element, OK? The reason we have to edit this web element is that this selection pattern um, is not correct, right? So this is selecting it right now with a very specific href URL. And this is absolutely wrong, right? What we actually want is for it, we need a strategy that's actually going to go through uh, the table. And we're going to look at how this works. This is one of the most powerful pieces of this software, right, is the ability to traverse these tables, OK? So what we actually want is this. Let's start with this strategy here, root descended child, OK? So what is this strategy doing? It's actually finding this uh, div, which has the uh, ID, which is what we want, right? Then it's going to find the table, the T body, and the TR, OK? Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. As you can see here, it has this index number here. We can say, I want to find TR number three. Okay. Now, this is not always going to be the case. It could be TR1. It could be TR2. It could be TR4. So this is the wrong strategy. We don't want that. right? Um, what we actually want is we want to add a condition on this TR 
And what we want is we want the one that has site 331, okay? So remember, the one that we want is this one, 331, right? So what we actually want to do here is we're going to come in here. We're going to say the text contains 331, all right? So what this is going to do is it's going to find a TR, and it's going to use an XPath selector. And if you know about HTML and XPath, what's going to happen is it's going to extract all the text, right, uh, across all the cells and all the child elements. And we want to find the one that has 331, okay? Once we find the one with 331, we want to find, you know, we also want to find, um, we want to find the one that has 331, and we also want the TD to contain, let's do this, right? Let's, let's think about this for a moment. We want 331, right? And we also want the row to contain, uh, to contain our ID, right? Because there could be multiple ones with 331. So that's not good enough. We're going to have to change this strategy a little bit, right? So let's do this first, right? Contains. We're going to insert a token, add a new field. Let's rename this field session ID. <coughs> okay. We want the row uh, that contains the session ID, okay? But the row... In the third, in the third TD, right? In the third TD, uh, one, two. In the second TD, in the second TD, okay. Has to have a condition, right? Uh, that has a text value that contains uh, contains three three one. Okay. So the row contains the session ID, and the second cell contains the. You know what? Let's invert these. Let's invert these. Let's bring this back. I want the session ID here. Text contains three three one, right? And what we want is in the first column, uh, we have the session ID. Okay. And the and the reason is going to be really clear, is because the A is going to be a child element of this first column, and that's what we want to click, right? All right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to validate this first and see if we find it exactly what we want. Okay, so our strategy worked. What we're doing now is we're selecting the row that contains this identifier, right? Then in the second, uh, that, has, that has a 331, right? Number one is our first rule is the row contains 331. Then the row uh, in the first cell contains our session ID, and we're going to click that A. We want this A, right? Uh, so that's good. That's exactly what we want. We, we found one. Um, of six, right? So there's actually six six rows that look like this, uh, which doesn't make sense. Let's see here. If we click next, what happens here? So that's not correct, right? Uh, and that makes sense because we haven't passed in the session ID, okay? So let's do this. What we want here is we have the session ID now, and what we're going to do is we're just going to grab this result value and pass it in, Okay. So you can see now, and we want to wait for uh, await DOM changes. We'll just wait two seconds for that to load. OK, so now what's going to happen is we're going to find the right row because we have our session ID uh, parameterized now. OK? And once we, once we get this going, and in fact, we're going to run it from um, one of the challenges here is once you have the session ID, you have to run the whole thing to generate the session ID. Um, Let's see if we can loop this through to here as well and loop this through to here. Okay, so we're going to fix that later for right now uh, because we want to generate the session ID. Uh, we're just going to shortcut this, okay? Uh, well, in fact, we can't do that because we have to generate the session ID when we do the distribution, um, so that's okay. We're going we're gonna to bring this up back up here. Right? We're going to leave this here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to bring this up as if we clicked it. Okay? And we're going to start recording the next step. Okay? And this is, you know, really why I, I love this tool because it's so flexible. Right? So we're going to click web element. Okay? 
Um, click web element. I think this is what we want at this step. And we choose our element. Um, we're going to rename this here. OK. And we're going to type. Actually, let's, let's, let's not use this. Let's use type web text. And we're going to type 001. We just have to space 001. And we just have to select this guy here. OK, so this is going to do our first upload. Um, and actually, we also, want to, uh, we also want to up here choose a file, right? So we're going to connect a, we're going to change the order, but we can connect this like this. Uh, upload, web file upload. So we're going to select here. OK. And we are going to select the file to upload. And we're just going to use the same file. OK, and we're going to change the order of this. We want this to come to here. And then this is going to come to here. OK. Um, and then what we're going to do is we will, let's, let's do this. Let's delete this. All right, so we can run it from here just to test it out. We chose our file, typed our value, done. OK. And now, uh, now we can click Submit. OK. Click Web Element. And we're going to click Submit. All right, so that took care of that, right? Uh, now what we, you can see it disappeared. We actually want to upload more documents to it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come back and find that task. Because that, that task, we can upload one, we can upload multiple. We only need one, but let's upload multiple, OK? Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to click Web Element. And we're going to click here. OK, and then we're going to click this one here. Whoop. Click this specific one. And then we're going to click our document type here, this guy here. And if we wanted to, we can make this very generic, right? We can make this a subflow if we wanted to. We don't have to um, because we're just clicking through. But even this could be become a subflow really easily, right? Just by parameterizing everything. Now, once we click this, we have our task here, right? Again, we have another table here, and what we want to do is we want to have a good strategy here. Uh, we're going to click, okay? We're going to click this guy. Right? And we want to change our strategy here because, again, this is the incorrect strategy, right? We want to use this root descended child because we want to find the uh, table TR, TD, and the A, right? We don't want to use the position based one that it's suggesting. What we actually want in this case um, is that the TR um, contains text contains and we're going to add our field rename the field okay we want this to contain the session id and then let's just let's just look at this we're going to find the a element and that's what we're clicking right so uh, text contains session id in the row find the td uh, that contains the a so this one, we can use the first one, right? Because we know it's in the first column, um, contains the A. And again, we just take the session ID and bring it over here. OK? So we're going to click this. Uh, let's just run it from, we're going we're gonna to click it manually, because if we run it from here, it's not going to work correctly. 
Uh, actually, in fact, this is the one, this is the link that we want to click, okay? So it's not the first cell, it's the third cell, right? So we can just change this to the one, two, uh, three, okay? And in fact, we can, we can make this more generic, right? We can add condition on the cell, the cell contains um, upload, okay? Let's see what this actually says. Upload and accept, right? So upload and accept, okay? So we're gonna find the row that contains the session ID, find the cell that contains upload and accept, and then click the A element that's in it, right? That's what we want. So it's super powerful. We're gonna click this manually now because, you know, again, the session ID um, is transient. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add web file. So actually we can copy this. Uh, let's do this. Web file upload. This is the guy we want. Okay, select data file. And we are going to type web text. We're going to type into here, space 002. Click web element. And submit. OK, so that's not good because we need to uh, actually run this, right? So we're just going to run this. Okay, perfect. Right, so you can see it typed in our value 002. And what we're going to do here is we just, uh, now we can click submit. Okay, and what we want to do once we click submit is we're going to upload three documents. So we're just going to copy this whole thing over. And you get these options to copy or duplicate. Um, we're going to duplicate. Okay, and connect this to here. And this over to here and make this number three. Okay, so we're going to do a total of three uploads against this distribution. Um, you can see like as soon as you start seeing patterns like this, you can start to, you can start to create a subflow um, and basically parameterize this. We're not going to do that now. Um, let's run through this whole thing actually, right? So let's see what happens, okay? Okay, so now we have our flow uh, almost partially, con almost completely configured here. Uh, you know, we're logged out here. We're gonna come in as the first user, initiate the distribution, and complete three uploads against that distribution. Okay, so we just select the, where we want to start and hit Control R. Uh, that'll start our run. So again, we log in as the first user who's going to initiate the document upload and the distribution uh, that'll create the task that'll be completed by the second user. ESA, that's our, that's our uh, session ID. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna wait for about 20 seconds here for the distribution to process on the back end. Um, that's going to generate the email notification and also generate uh, the tasks that get assigned to the second user uh, before we log in as that user, okay? So now BSA, our tasks uh, are right there. We're at the third row this time. We click it. So this is our first upload. Okay. And now we are going to do our second and third uploads.
And that's it, right? So our very last step here, it says click web element. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's our very last step here is the submit, right? So we got all the way to the end, right? And now what we're actually going to do is we're going to log out as this user here, OK? So we're going to just copy this block here, this log out, um, and paste it here. And we're going to bring this guy over to here. We're going to log out. And we're going to add a wait for the backend events to process for the completion. Okay. Then once we log out, we're actually going to log in as our first user. Okay. And we just want to uh, connect this down to here. So we have our password. Okay. And now that we've logged in as this user, <coughs> excuse me, what we're going to do um, is we're going to look for that task again and complete the approval and rejection of those tasks. Okay. Um, so what we can do is we can start from right here because we just finished this step. We can start from right here and log in as this user and let's see what we got, okay? So again, we just select where we want to start, control R. Sign out, we wait five seconds because in the normal flow, that's what we would want to do. And we log back in as our first user, right? So if you remember our uh, last run, um, and actually, we can pick any one of these, actually. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to click one of these. Uh, it is this BSA one, right? So what we're going to do is we're, as this user, we're going to come in. We're going to click this one. And we're going to approve the first one and reject the second one, OK? So what we're going to do here is we're going to, once we log in, we want to click web element, and we will select uh, this link here, OK? And we're, we'll come back and fix this strategy. It doesn't matter so much right now. Um, then we are going to uh, click this guy here, right? OK, so let's do this. We're just going to kind of set it up like this so that we're already here. Then we are going to click web element. Okay. And we're going to click this guy. Okay. And then we're going to click another web element. We're going to accept this one. And click Submit. OK. And then we're going to click the one that has, uh, just to make it interesting, we're going to click uh, uh, this one that has the number three in it. All right. We're going to put this here. going to click feedback this time. And then we click submit. All 
All right. Let's just move these down here to line them up. Okay. So one of the things that we have to do now is we have to change the way, um, let's add a Dom weight here. One of the things that we're going to have to do here is that we're going to have to change the, add our Dom weight here too, uh, the selection for this row, right? Again, we're going to use our same strategy, uh, strategy that we used above. Um, when we have this, you know, right now the default one is selecting by the ID, but the ID is going to change every time, right? So the strategy we want to use is uh, this uh, table T body TRA um, strategy. And what we want is we want the table, the T body, the TR. We don't want child number, we just want child. Um, the TR that contains, um, let's see here what this task looks like if we come here. Uh, we want the TR that has 331. In this case, all of them will have it. That's OK. Uh, TR contains uh, 331 text contains 331. Um, it's going to match all the rows, and it's going to go one by one. But what we want is we want the child TD that has the text, OK? of the session ID, right? So we want the text contains, um, and we add our field. And let's just rename our field so it's really clear. Okay, session ID. And session ID, TRTD contains session ID, and then we're gonna click the yay, okay? Um, so we can just save that, all right? So now what we're going to have to do is here is where we have our session ID. We just want to connect this down to here. Okay. And once we click that, that's going to launch this guy. And we're going to click the View button, right? Now, the, all of these tasks are going to have the session ID, right? Uh, but what we need to do is we need to use a slightly different strategy here is we want the TR, we don't want any TR, right? This is, again, the default is to here uh, use child number, but we don't know exactly where it's going to be every time, right? Um, in this case, we actually do, but you know what we can do is we just add a condition here and say the text uh, contains 0, 0, 001, okay? So we're going to approve 0, 0, 001. Okay. And we're going to uh, reject. Right, we just change this again to change this to child. Child, we want to add the condition that the text contains 003. Right? And that's the one we're going to reject, all right? So if we look at this full flow now, after we do the upload, uh, we're going to log in as our initial user and basically review the documents that were uploaded by our second user, right? And one of the tasks we're going to accept, one of the tasks we're going to send to feedback, okay? Um, just make sure we have our weights here all set up so that looks good. All right, so we're all set up now. And what we're going to do is we're going to sign out. Uh, we have this guy fully parameterized again. So again, we have the session ID here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to come in and start from the beginning again and launch this, launch this uh, and see the full flow, OK?
So again, we're waiting about 20 seconds here for the backend engine to finish processing before we log in as our second user. RYG is our identifier this time, our session ID. Okay, that was our second upload and our third upload. Now we sign out. And now we wait five seconds and we're logging back in as the first user. Now the first user should have the review task. Okay, RYG, right at the top. And we have our three, so we click one. We're going to accept this one. And we click three. Oh. So it failed. It said no web element found to click. And again, what that typically means um, is that, uh, like, this is the step we failed on here. What that typically means is we have to just give it an await DOM change and give it, like, uh, one second is, is probably enough in this case. Okay. So I don't think we need to run through this full thing because, you know, it's uh, fairly straightforward. Um, you know, one thing we do want to do now is to, you know, look at how we would process notifications and emails, okay? So assuming you made it all the way to this point, um, in our system, this would generate a bunch of emails. And the question is, you know, how do you process these emails to make sure you actually got the notifications that you are expecting, okay? Um, so let me log into, uh, let me actually create a new one. New flow. Okay. So we're going to check our emails now. And basically, uh, rather than attaching it onto that flow, I'm just going to create a all new flow just to make it a little bit easier. And what we want to do is we want to go to Outlook. All right. So we're going to close this out here. And we're just going to add a new block. Okay, start web browser and connect this. And we're going to go to Outlook. Okay. And then we are going to type in a username, type in a password, um, and basically walk through how we would iterate through email. Okay. Um, so let's. Let's just run this real quick, make sure, get to our starting point, and then start recording our next steps after that. So again, it starts on my second screen. It'll bring it over to my first screen. All right, perfect. All right, so we're here in Outlook, right? And I'm just going to set this, edit this, set this to maximized. And now we're going to connect this to... Uh, type text. Okay, and we're going to select this element here. And I have this already here, so I'm just going to paste it in. Okay. And then we're going to click. We don't want this one, we want to click web element. And that's fine. We'll run it from here. Okay. And then we can put in our password. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to add our, again, type web text, select our element. And here we're going to add a building block. Set text. OK. 
Okay, change this to password. Put our password in here and connect our password up to here. Okay, uh, type web text. Now, the thing is, you notice there's an animation. So as soon as you notice there's an animation, you're going to want to put in an await DOM change because um, you're going to need it, right? So we put that there, and then we're going to uh, click web element and click sign in. All right, so now we're going to run this from here. Okay, and once again, we're going to click Web Element. And we're going to hit this no. And again, because we see the animation, we just add the await DOM changes. Okay. So here we are logged in, and the question is, how do we find what we're looking for, right? There's literally... Uh, hundreds of thousands of emails in here, and we have to find the right one. And the trick is actually to use the search bar to find what we're looking for uh, before we start our iterations, right? So we know the, the name of the user in this case, so what we're going to do is we're going to go like this, okay? And we're going to type web text. And we're going to type it right into this search bar here. All right, and the question is, what are we going to type? Uh, what are we going to capture? And what we actually want to capture in this case, what we actually want to type in there is we want to type the name of the user, right? So let's, let's look at what happens here. Um, we have the name of the user because we know the format of the email, right? We can see that if we do an exact match like this, uh, we can find a lot of the emails um, that are associated to this user, okay? So we can start with that. But the problem is what we, let's add this here. Let's see here. So if we click on one of these, you'll see it starts with deer, right? So what we want is deer. Um, and that should be good. OK, we can just run this and see what happens. OK. So in fact, we need to do an additional step, right? What we want is we want to type it and hit enter to initiate the search, right? So let's do that. We have to capture an enter key. And now let's come back to the inbox and run this step again. Perfect. All right. Now, what we want to do is we actually want to find, you know, narrow this down even a bit more. Um, there are still hundreds, if not thousands, of results. But there's very specific emails that we're looking for. And actually, we can kind of use the same strategy, right? Is that, hey, let's say we're looking for this one, right? One of our runs here. We're just going to take this value here and put that into our search criteria. Okay, Now, if we were in the other flow, we would just take the session ID and drag the parameter here. For now, we're just going to test it like this. That's perfectly fine. Get rid of this. All right, look at that. So this is great because it gave us a much smaller search set to go through. Right? Um, we know we want to verify. You know, we may want to verify each of these emails, uh, but, you know, maybe we just need to find one of them. And, you know, in this test scenario, in this test case, what it's actually testing is that you can see over the passage of time from 11.10 a.m. to 11.20 to 11.25, the status of our task changes from important, right, to uh, do soon, to at some point um, do soon, and eventually at some point it will become uh, overdue, okay? Um, actually, it doesn't go to overdue in this particular case. It's not set up to go to overdue. It's set up to go to a different status. 
uh, basically goes out of your queue uh, rather than becoming overdue. So what we want to do is we want to find that there's at least one where this is going to say, hey, um, this is important, right? Or you know what? Let's find the one that has it with the do soon, right? Because if we just find this first one, it's not that interesting, right? So now what we want to use is we want to use a very powerful tool here. Uh, we could just click it, but we don't actually know exactly which one it is, right? Um, it could be this first email, it could be the second email, it could be the third email, there could be 10 emails. Um, we don't know for sure, right? So what we actually want to use is we want to use find web element, okay? So the find web element uh, block here, this is a super powerful block because it has this capability to initiate built-in iterations. And let's see how that works, all right? So the first thing is we want to identify the thing that we're finding. And the thing that we're finding is we want to find each of these messages. And that's what we're iterating through. So we're going to click on this guy. Hopefully, this is the outermost layer here. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at our uh, element here. right? So we don't want this. right? We don't want this uh, here because that's no good. We also don't want this condition here. right? Uh, but this is way too generic, okay? So if we validate this div div thing, um, oh, it, there's, there's way too many of these, right? So this is not the right strategy, okay? So the challenge here is that you will have to know some bit of DOM, right? You ha will have to know some bit of DOM and how to work around uh, the DOM tree here to find the right div div combination, okay? So if we were to, if we were to look at this guy here, uh, I'm going to close this out real quick. If we were to look at this guy here, and we bring up our uh, inspector, right? So we've this is the guy that we want here, right? This div here is what we want. Um, maybe this div out here, right? That's that's that might be good enough. Okay, so we got this div with this class here, but this is not really usable, right? What we want is we want something that's going to be unique. And this is the one that I think is the closest. So there's this div with, we could potentially use this one, right, where the class contains custom scroll bar, right? But this is, seems a little bit more stable to me. Um, so what we're going to do is div area label equals message list, all right? So we're going to change the strategy, edit web element, and we're going to uh, ancestor uh, div class attribute Aria label, Aria label contains message list. Okay, so this is the one we want. Aria label uh, contains message list. This gives us some flexibility um, rather than using a direct equals. And now what we want is that in here we want to select a child element. Uh, like this one, um, and click on it, okay? So you can see here, there's a couple of different ways we can use this. A real label here, we can't use it, right? Because this has the actual, um, this has the actual title, and it could be different every time. So if we want this to be generic, what we actually want, maybe we can try this uh, role equals option, okay? So we're going to do div uh, attribute role equals option, okay? So let's try this and validate. And we don't want to use occurrence because we, it might not be the first occurrence, right? So let's validate. Okay, and let's see, what do we get here? Is look, we found one of three, right? That means there are three occurrences that we could iterate through. And that's exactly what we want because we don't know where our message is, right? So we're going to save this because this is perfect. So it's going to click through, okay, each of these. And again, the one that we are interested in is we want the one, uh, we, want, we want, let's say, this one, the first message where we have a do soon, okay? So this is the one that we want. Um, and let's do it like this, okay? You can see down here, once we click through this, right, 
Okay. Once we once we found this element, right? What we actually want to do is we want to click the web element. Okay. Now the question is, how do we do that? And this is where you have to start paying attention to some of the capabilities that you have here, right? So look at this. When we found when we find the element, look at this. This has a blue connector on it. That means we can pass this as data to the element that we're going to click, right? So once we find it, we want to click that element. The element that we're going to click is going to be the one that we found, right? And once we click it, what we want to do is we want to verify uh, that we have this text here, right? So what we want to do is we want to find text, right? So is there a find web text? Let's see. Find web text. So we're going to get web text, OK? So what we want to do is we want to get the web text uh, from uh, this right-hand side. And the text that we're looking for is going to be in this table, OK? So we just click this. This is what we're looking for, right? And we want to find one that has with this with the do soon, OK? All right. So what we've done here is, number one, is we've, we're looking for each of these elements, right? Uh, once we find the element, we want to click on the element. And then once we click on the element, we want to find the text and verify that it exists, OK? Now, what's interesting down here is you'll see we have this use occurrence, right? So by default, we are only using the first element, right? But we can say, actually, we want to process all the elements. We want to go through each of them. And once you do that, you can pass the current index, OK? And you can see here there's a completed, meaning that we iterated through all of the elements, all right? So let's do this now. We click here. We find web text. Uh, let's edit this web element because right now we're finding a text uh, we're finding this particular text, and that's not exactly what we want, right? What we want is we don't, we're not looking for this particular A, right? We want probably this T, T body, TR, TD. What we want is the TR, okay? We don't want child number. We just want child at condition uh, text contains. We want it to contain overdue. Let's see. Or is it due soon? We want it to say do soon, OK? And we want the TD, right? Again, we don't want child number. We want the child. Yeah, maybe we do. We want child TD. Is it three? One, two, three. TD3 contains our session ID, right? Again, I'm just copying the session ID here. But if it were part of my original flow, uh, what I would do, child td3, td3 text contains our session ID. Okay, so if I were in my other flow, what we would do is we would, we would set the field here and drag the parameter here for the session ID, okay? And in fact, why don't we do that, right? Let's take this out so that we can parameterize this um, and just add the field here. So we'll set this as session ID. Okay, and then we're gonna get the text of the A. Okay, and that's all. That's all that we want. We have our session ID here. Um, in fact, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna um, add a building block, set text. Okay, and set that as session ID. And we're gonna pull this to here. And we're also going to pull this to here. OK. And now we can delete this and insert session ID. OK. So now we have uh, the emails that we're looking for. And what we want to do is, look, we're going to iterate this, right? So it's going to go through the first one. And when it clicks the first one, it's not going to find what we're looking for, right? 
Um, so what, what, what's going to happen? Then it's going to click the second one. But once we found the second one, what we want to do is we actually want to exit, right? So what we want to do is we want to, um, we want to in this particular case, break the iteration, right? So what we're doing is breaking the current scope of the iteration. That's going to break out of this iteration right here. You can also set it to all iterations to be safe because you only want to be in one iteration at a time. Um, you know, the nested iteration may not be really clear when you're working with it like this. This is a, like an implicit iteration. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to break all iterations. And once we find it, you know, we can also do a comparison on the text, right, uh, to make sure that it's the text that we're expecting uh, to do our condition, okay? Now, if we don't find this element at all, right, we can explicitly fail and set a message. OK? All right. Now, once this iteration is completed, we can again, then we can go to, uh, we just pass, right? All right. So now, OK, let's run this from the beginning, right? All right, so Leapwork started the browser on the window. It'll bring it into this window momentarily. Okay, there we go. We do our login. We await the DOM change into the password. You can see anytime you have this kind of animation where the DOM might not be totally ready, you want to await the DOM change. Right, and we enter our search term at the top to narrow down our messages. Okay, and we start iterating through our email. And in fact, this this passed immediately uh, because it showed up on the first one. Uh, but if we were looking for, let's try looking for something different, right? Let's try looking for the overdue. This is going to be the second one, right? So let's change our test condition because I want to show you how this iterates through this, right? Um, let's change our text here so that we're going to look for, instead of that, we're going to look for overdue, okay? So we're going to do overdue and save. Let's close this and run this from the beginning, right? Because we want to see it with more than one iteration. Right? Do our login. do our initial filtering by entering a search term. And now, this time, we should hit the second one, right? So our first one doesn't have the overdue message. And it gives it, it takes a little bit of time, and it's going to iterate to the next email. OK, there we go. So click the second email, and now we found it. And we broke our uh, iteration, and the flow passed, right? So this find web element, and you know all the all the, um, you know, actually, you can also do it here as well, is that you can create these implicit iterations by changing the occurrence that you're using. So by default, it's using the first occurrence, but when you get web text or when you do anything like that, you can say, hey, I want to iterate over everything. And you create this implicit iteration uh, by changing the, which, how many times you want to iterate over it, uh, the matching elements, and then click all. And you can see here, 
you know, this is really powerful. Once you find the element, you can just pass the element forward into this click web element um, and automatically click it, okay? All right, so that's about it. I mean, there are different scenarios and different things you can do in this, um, in leap work. Uh, but I think really, if you can do this much with it, you can pretty much do anything. There's a couple of other interesting blocks in here. One of those blocks being the, um, the switch block. So you can do a lot of interesting things with the switch block. For example, by testing if a user has exactly uh, five things that they can see uh, by using a switch and then falling out of the switch in the else case and going into a, into a failure scenario, right? And you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, other capabilities in here that you just don't see in other tools. So we didn't even look at these, but you can hover a web element. So you can basically move the mouse over the web element and hover over that if you have some sort of um, UI capabilities that are dependent on the user hovering over uh, part of your UI. You can hover a web position. You can do screenshots. Um, you can run JavaScript if you needed to. Um, you can do all sorts of interesting things that you know I haven't really seen in other systems. And again, with one tool, you know, you can also you can also automate your desktop UI. So you can start applications. You can, you know, if you wanted to use Desktop Outlook, you can use Desktop Outlook instead of Web Outlook, right? Um, you can do image and text rec recognition. So this is a really interesting capability that I haven't found the need to use yet. But what you can do is you can find text anywhere on the screen. So in the documentation, they have good examples of this. Uh, but this is super powerful, especially when you're doing web interfaces that are under, uh, potentially you'll have layout changes, right? So if you're still actively developing and you'll have layout changes, instead of finding the exact element to click, you can find the image of the element that you're targeting and click where it found the image. So this is super powerful if you have a user interface that's under flux, right? And you want to be able to run your test without having to update it every time the engineers move a button somewhere else, right? Um, you have mouse and keyboard. So again, you have this drag, click and drag mouse that you can do. You can scroll, you can hover a position, which is really cool in my opinion. Um, Data-driven, you know, of course, you have command line. You can connect it directly to the database. You can execute REST or other HTTP requests. Um, read, e read data from Excel and write data to Excel. So like you see here, how we broke this out into two separate um, two separate test case, test flows. We could actually take this one, write the session ID to Excel, and then read the session ID from the second one to continue the flow if we wanted to design it that way, right? Um, other things we can do, we can start and stop. So done, pass, fail. Um, you have these logic ones. So you can, if you wanted to, inject C-sharp code. Um, again, super powerful. You can run you know, regular expressions to match your strings to test if it's the right string that you got. Um, you can do simple compares, right? There's a ton of capabilities in here for you to do all sorts of scenarios. Um, you can set variables and get variables. So this is like the session ID. Instead of dragging it around like this, you can set the variable and then use the variable. I find it easier to just connect the blocks uh, versus using set get variables. The generators we saw, you can generate date times, numbers, passwords. Um, passwords are especially useful if you need something like a GUID for a session, but you don't quite have. Uh, you don't want to use the command line to generate a GUID. Um, set value, we saw these, right? We can set the value um, for the text values for the password, for example. Uh, there's debugging, which we, I, did, I don't really use this one, but you can log messages. Um, you can, you know, if you wanted to add a comment block in here, you can add a comment block, hey. Okay, so one of the downsides though is, you know, obviously this comment is kind of like free floating and you can't really attach it to anything. So if you move this element, you know, you gotta remember to move this, move this around with it. Um, it'd be really nice if these things had their own comments and then, you know, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, cell level comment where you mouse over it, you could see the comment, uh, whoever designed this flow, why they configured it the way they configured it. Okay. Um, other than that, you know, you have your subflows. So every time you create a subflow, it's in here, and you can reuse the subflows across uh, across the different scenarios. Now, there's a lot of features that I'm not going to get into here because I don't have a remote agent running. But the gist of it is, once you have the remote agent running, you can create these schedules, and you can schedule uh, multiple tests to run automatically um, in off hours, and then you'll get a report. You know, you'll get all these reports um, that have 
uh, information regarding your test runs. And each of these reports, you know, if you click it, you can actually go in and you can see the full history of the run, right? So it's super cool, um, super powerful, like I said before. I think this is, you know, honestly speaking, in the 20 years that I've been doing software and all the tools I've used, um, this is definitely one of the, the most powerful tools out there. And again, this, the reason is simple is that you don't have to spend a lot of time to be very productive and be able to do a lot with this tool, right? You probably need one or two days to really familiarize yourself with how the tool works and all the different ways you can navigate and, and connect things together. But the beauty is, is you know, this tool is super intuitive, right? Um, once, you, once you get started with it, you can work with it how you want to work with it, you know? If you want to record, you can record. If you want to build it step by step, you can build it step by step. And it's really powerful in that it allows you to refactor, you know, these test cases really easily just by selecting, uh, selecting a bunch of uh, blocks here and then, you know, creating a subflow out of it. You can get tremendous reuse out of this, right, without having to do any programming. Um, so I think this is a super powerful tool. I think if you've been holding off on doing automated uh, UI testing because the tools are too complicated, it's too time consuming, you know, I think LeapWork is definitely where you want to invest some time in evaluating this tool uh, because it is simply so powerful, so easy to use. I've never seen anything like this on the market before. Again, this is not a paid promotion. Uh, LeapWork is not paying me at all. They didn't give me a free license. My license is gonna expire um, in a couple days, my trial license, uh, but we will end up buying licenses for this software uh, because it's so good, right? So I do recommend that you reach out to LeapWork. I do recommend that you do give it a, you know, give the free trial a run. Commit yourself to, you know, really working with it for two or three days so you're really comfortable with some of the more complex scenarios. Um, you know, again, for us, really the most complex scenarios are uh, really iterating through tables and trying to find values, right? And this tool, you know, LeapWork makes that super easy compared to doing that with Selenium and writing code, right? So definitely, you know, Leave a comment if you have any questions. If there, uh, my demo license will expire, but uh, if there's anything you'd like to see, you know, we can always uh, create a, make a second video and see if we can show you how that gets done in this system. Um, so, yeah, give this a try. All right.